back to my channel. I'm Leandra the TBRZ Girl and I forgot to provide an intro for this vlog. So here we are. I am reading three mystery thrillers this week and all three of them are quite different when it comes to their genre blend proportions. One of them that I am reading is Lucy Foley's The Midnight Feast. I'm very excited for this one. You can see that I'm already reading it and I am getting prepared for a mid book update. So you will be seeing me in this outfit again uh, very soon. But what I can tell you so far is that this is my third read of a Lucy Foley novel. I've read two before, one I loved, one I was not so into. Can you guess which titles I'm talking about? Well, I'm going to reveal them right now. So the book I really loved by Lucy Foley was The Guest List. I know a lot of people said that was overhyped. They weren't really big fans of it. My thoughts on the matter is that as a mystery thriller, it leaned more mystery. That's why it worked for me and that's why it didn't work for a lot of people. Meanwhile, the book that wasn't for me by this author was The Hunting Party. I just was not that impressed with it. Everyone was insufferable. I didn't feel like rooting for anyone and it definitely leaned more thriller than mystery. When I entered this book, I was really hoping for it to be more mystery than thriller, giving me more guestless vibes. And you're gonna have to keep watching the vlog <laughs> to find out if my hopes were actually met. The Midnight Feast follows the grand opening of The Manor. It is a spa resort set in this rural community in Dorset, I believe, and obviously the rural community is not happy about it. Meanwhile, those who are up on the hill, the upper percent, are enjoying themselves, getting ready for the opening weekends, fun celebrations, which includes the solstice. However, it seems as though something occurs the night of the solstice, and that's why we're getting dual timelines as far as the events after the solstice solstice, the events leading up to the solstice, a very classic Lucy Foley kind of design and a very classic thriller design too actually. Another book I am reading for this vlog is Sherry Lapina's newest title, What Have You Done? This one I'm super excited for because it's my first experience with this author. I know that a lot of people absolutely adore her and I actually just got the audio in preparation for this vlog so I will be listening to it if I end up loving it or if I enjoy it enough but feel as though I need to wait for the physical copy I will do that but I'm really hoping that the audio works out and I could just breeze through it. This one opens with the discovery of a dead body in a farm field. This is set in a rural community of Vermont and the dead body is that of a young popular teen girl. They are trying to figure out what happened to her and wondering is the monster within our community, from our community, and if so, will he or she strike again? And the third book that I am reading for this vlog is another new release. I'm reading three books from 2024 and I'm very excited about that. This one is a debut by Marley Bush. I actually got the art for it. I did not read it when it came out. Whoops, we are making up for lost time. And it's called When She Was Me. This one follows twin sister protagonists. We have another dual timeline here. And the modern one actually is set in an isolated campground. I love the idea of that setting. And it's in Tennessee as well. While these twins are very deeply connected and their relationship is semi unhealthy, it's partially because of what they've experienced in their past. And now there is a modern crime going on just outside their door and they're going to have to sift through, figure out what happened while also coping with what's happened in their past. Obviously, as I said, I currently know semi how I feel about these books, but it's up to you to keep watching to figure out if I would recommend any of these books to you. On that note, as you're watching, if I end up discussing these books and they remind you of titles that you would recommend to me, please leave a comment below. I would greatly appreciate any help, especially because there are mystery thrillers that I've loved, but there's also mystery thrillers that I haven't. So if I can find winners in this genre blend, I would really appreciate your help. All right, let's see what past Leandra thought.
getting 90 pages through the Midnight Feast while on sprints today, so I figured this is a good time to provide a Twilight update. I had such a fun time today with Lauda. It was really good to see her. It's been quite some time since we've been on screen together because she's in the Netherlands, because I'm in the United States. There's a six hour gap between us. And so life just gets in the way, time zones get in the way, but it was really lovely that she was able to spend her Tuesday night with me while I got through my afternoon trying to read The Midnight Feast. And this is actually going by far quicker than I expected. I shouldn't be surprised because Lucy Foley is known for having multiple POVs, very short chapters. We're jumping around, so it feels as though it's a very fast-paced narrative just because of that kind of dynamic, that kind of structure. And I'm very relieved that I'm having a good time with it. I'm really enjoying the atmosphere, the tension surrounding this manor estate that has been transformed into a spa resort for the rich. And I'm also feeling as though I have returned to the original Lucy Foley that I knew and loved, which was The Guest List. I know that The Hunting Party was published first, but my first experience was The Guest List. So I, when I loved that and then really didn't like The Hunting Party, I started to distrust myself in picking up the right Foley titles. It's why I avoided The Paris Apartment because The Paris Apartment felt a bit more thriller, but The Midnight Feast definitely feels more mystery, which is Ah, oh, so great. I'm so excited. I love that we continue to have multiple POVs, that the characters come from different walks of life. So we're looking at this setting from a different lens. We have Francesca Meadows and her husband Owen. Both of them receive their own POVs. Francesca is the woman who has transformed the manor into a resort. Her husband was the architect and they both seem to have ties to this Dorset shoreline, which may or may not culminate in some of the dangerous violent events that I'm predicting are going to happen in this novel. It's also set in the peak of summer, June. It's a scorching weekend for their opening weekend. It's supposed to be all celebration, being social, getting good press, but because it's going to be so hot, I actually love that when it happens because that means tensions are going to run high, emotions are going to run high, people are going to be struggling to stay cool both physically, mentally, and emotionally. So outbursts are to be expected, arguments are going to be far more heated, and people may lash out violently. So I'm preparing for that, but we have them representing our elite POVs, and then we have some others including Bella. She is one of the guests and she's come under false pretenses. She's arrived pretending to be this person in media in like a niche film industry. But in reality, she also has history with this Dorset seaside town where her family used to summer and she has an interesting connection to Francesca as well. Then we have Eddie. He is our local perspective. He works as a dishwasher trying to work his way up to being a bartender. His father owns the farm right next door which is something he's trying to hide because he doesn't want the owners, the other staff to realize it. He also doesn't want his father to realize that he's working at the manor. So there's just a lot of familial relationship tension going on and that also goes with like friendships romantic relationships just a lot of people hiding things which I really love and I'm eating up one part of the story I haven't touched upon yet that is a bit of an outlier and adding to the spookiness of this book making it kind of perfect for spooky autumnal season even though it's set in summer is the mentions of this folklore local legend called the birds People are warning their children, warning their friends, their loved ones, not to walk through the woods at night, not to cut through the woods, even if it's shorter. They say you shouldn't be doing that because the birds are there. And there's also been a death prior to the book's opening pages. The man was muttering about the birds when he was discovered. With his body was a single black feather. We've also seen a single black feather be discovered elsewhere in the modern timeline and I'm just thinking is that an omen? The person who had the feather on their pillow, does that mean they're going to be the ones to die? I don't know. I'm really liking that. It's adding an extra texture to this and showing that we may be juggling some supernatural entity or at least the feeling as though you're being watched from the woods by a supernatural entity while also dealing with a lot of messiness and drama with the characters within the central cast. So I'm really enjoying that. So to put plainly, I have high hopes. I'm 
nearly a third of the way through the book, but I really do think that this may be another winner for me and Lucy Foley, and I'm very excited. I'm also excited that I get to participate in the B&K book club this month because this is their book chosen for the month, and I can't wait to see what everyone else thinks about it. So yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited that with the tentative TBR for this vlog that I had, I was the most excited for this one, but I also had the highest hopes for it. So there was a lot riding on it, but again, it's early days. We'll see what happens, but yahoo, feeling good. and I am here for another update but not with the Midnight Feast. I don't typically do this but I have started another book for this vlog so I'm juggling two at the moment and that one is going to be Sherry Lapina's What Have You Done? I needed an audiobook. Every other book I'm currently reading for this vlog and outside of it are physical reads either with print or ebook editions so I was just thinking I need something in my ears and Sherry Lapina's audiobook is due <laughs> for Libby in a matter of a week or so. So I was like, Leandra, you have to read it. So here we are. And I'm enjoying it so far. I'm only about 25% of the way through. I'm a bit worried because that's about where I am with the Midnight Feast. It's helpful that I'm reading this physically and listening to What Have You Done? But I'm aware that they have a lot of similarities. They're both set in a rural town. While this one is in England, what Have You Done is set in Vermont. So that is very helpful. Obviously, that means that we're dealing with different cultures, different countries, different backgrounds, even though they're both rural when it comes to the setting. Uh, we also have an instant murder, uh, which is very different from the Midnight Feast. A young girl, a teenager, Diana, she was discovered in a field. The farmer discovered her and now they've immediately started a murder investigation. So the timeline is singular starting from the moment they discovered the body which is different from the midnight feast because we have a juggling timeline there from events years ago up to events currently going on as well as events post the weekend of the solstice so actually midnight feast has like a few timelines going on but anyways i'm here to update you on what have you done so diana's death has really rattled this community we have POVs from her closest friends, Riley and Evan, her boyfriend, Cameron, her mother, uh, the mother's parents and staff members at the school, major people, a part of the community, really trying to figure out what happened, understand their own timeline. Could they have crossed paths with her? Who's guilty? And there's quite a few men who are suspicious at the moment. One of them includes Diana's boyfriend. He has anger issues. He seemed to be escalating in his control over her. She was considering breaking up with him and he's lied to the police. We already know through his POV that he lied to them. Uh, we also have this creepy man at the school. He was the gym teacher, also her track coach. There's been an allegation against him. And finally, we have this stranger in town. He seems to be a bit of a nomad, goes around, works for various construction sites, and he was harassing Diana at work and they just interviewed him. So there are a lot of suspicious characters. I have my eye on a couple people. I'm not gonna say who I think it may or may not be, but I, I will say this, along with Midnight Feast, feels like it could be a bit more mystery than thriller, even though it has thriller elements, including the huge cast of characters. We have, are in so many heads, and at the beginning of the audio, I did struggle. I was just thinking, well, I'm gonna just have to accept that at one point, I'm gonna figure out who's who. And now, at 25%, I think I've been listening maybe for an hour and a half, two hours at my own speed, and I'm, I'm aware of who the players are. There might be more POVs, but for now, I know who's who. And yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued, I'm enjoying it. I am really excited because this is my first time with the author and I have you know, encouraged myself to read quite a few new releases, which is exciting because I'm trying to prep for the Goodreads Choice Awards and consider what mystery thrillers could be on the list because we all know I'm kind of at a loss when it comes to pure thrillers, but the mystery elements, I gotcha. 
So I, I feel like so far both of these feel like they're contenders and I understand why there's a lot of hype around both authors. Obviously I read by Foley before, but with Sherry Lapina, I've only ever heard of the many books she's written. So I'm really happy I started with this one because it's got the vibes I like. I love a kind of domestic suburbia setting and especially when that's rural because it's meant to be a community that everyone knows, no one locks their doors. And the fact that there is a teen victim, we're dealing with the scope of people from all walks of life, adults as well as teen friends who are trying to process the grief and also protect themselves because you don't know if there's gonna be another murder. Oh, and I almost forgot, I don't know why I forgot this. My understanding, we've had this POV twice. I'm pretty sure we are also seeing the events through Diana's eyes almost as a ghost figure. I am still not fully sure. I wish I had the physical copy so I could double check, but there's been two moments where Diana has existed. She was actually watching from the hill, looking down, seeing her body being found. And then we also saw her POV while she was watching her mother grieve. So that adds a little bit of spookiness and I wasn't expecting any type of paranormal element in the story, but I like it. I love it when books get paranormal. So uh, that's that's been interesting too, but I'll let you guys know what I think. I promise, I hope that I'm only gonna be juggling Midnight Feast and What Have You Done. Once those two are done, then we can move on to another read. my coffee. <laughs> okay, now I'm ready for this update. I am actually already two thirds of the way through What Have You Done? I didn't want to provide an update until I was able to provide another update for Midnight Feast, but here we are. I haven't had time to physically read that book. And so I've just been whipping through What Have You Done? I mean, this honestly explains why people who read audiobooks rack up the numbers because it's very easy to get through, especially this mystery thriller. I am going to double down and say that I absolutely love the author's decision to include Diana. I feel like I may have been wishy-washy and uncertain if her perspective was even there, but I think it's because I only had it twice in the earlier update and it was so quick. It was probably only a couple minutes and then we were moving on to other characters that I was questioning myself if this actually was Diana's ghost, but we've had it a couple more times and she's my favorite. It's kind of sad because obviously she's been brutally murdered, but her emotions, her realization as memories come back to her because she can't fully remember what happened, but as she haunts all of these people during the investigation of her death, she begins to be angry, upset. And I'm really loving the fact that we get to see her perspective post her death. And I see most times when an author wants to provide the victim's perspective, that's where we're getting the dual timeline of the events leading up to the murder, before the murder, and then the events after. And this person who has died is only ever in the earlier setting for obvious reasons. So I like that the author took a chance and decided to provide Diana's perspective as a ghost for this. I also don't have any other complaints. The only thing that I'm still a little bit uh, about is the other first person POV. So we have Diana, she's first person POV and I love it. But then we have that epistolary perspective from one of her friends and I just don't care. I don't really think he's a dynamic character and I don't really know what he adds to the entirety of the novel. But honestly, I just feel really good about this book. 
I am intrigued. I want to know what happened to Diana. I want to see how all of the puzzle pieces work together. And I would argue this is a mystery thriller. Sometimes when I pick up books in this genre blend, it always leans more thriller than it does mystery. And that's not my cup of tea. So I prefer more mystery. And I would say this one's actually a pretty good balance of 50-50. We don't really have a sleuth, but we do have characters who are trying to find the truth, especially Diana's friends who are mourning her and Riley in particular wants answers and wants to find the person who did this so they can find justice for her. I've really appreciated the social commentary that Sherry Lapina has provided when it comes to safety for young women, for young girls, how they have to protect themselves in every single space within their lives, at home, among their friend group, their significant others, at school, the people who are in power at school, not protecting them, not believing them when there's an allegation against another staff member, and also at work with strangers who are coming up to her till when she's working at the Home Depot. I believe all of it, to be completely honest, and I'm glad that Sherry Lapina has decided to provide a voice for that kind of narrative. We'll see if these positive feelings hold up to the end. I have a third of the way through the book to go. There's a lot that could happen and a lot is writing on the end per the rules of mystery thrillers. I have an idea of who I think may be the major culprit, the major cause of her death, but it really could be anyone at this point. And I do think that it could make or break the novel because I'm really liking it so far. So if it doesn't go the way I want it to go, or at least in a way that I can live with, it will be kind of sad, but I, for now, I think I could totally see myself trying this author again. So that's very exciting. Until next time, I'm taking a break from reading. I'm going to watch some booktube. No, not Flamingo Tube. I have another screen and I actually have Kirsten, the Reading Nymph's most recent vlog on. So I'm gonna watch that. I'm gonna relax, finish my coffee, and we'll see what I get up to after that. back. Do you recognize the background? My outfits? Well, it's me from the intro. You have officially reached the part in which I recorded that bit and now I'm going to tell you what I've been thinking so far. So the last time I updated you, it was a couple days ago. I've had a very busy weekend, but I was in the middle of two books, Midnight Feast as well as What Have You Done. I have finished one of those books. 
what have you done? And I can tell you, I really enjoyed it. This was a great mystery thriller. I would argue it might be 50-50 split down the middle. And I'm really impressed because a lot of times when I'm picking up mystery thrillers, I'm nervous that it's 60% thriller, 70% thriller. But this one had both elements in pretty equal fashion. And I think that's why I was able to enjoy it. The audiobook was fast paced. I was really intrigued. I was invested in all of the perspectives except for one, which was the epistolary one. We know my thoughts about it. And I wanted to know what happened to Diana. I was fascinated by all of the secrets that these characters were hiding. It asks some really important questions about loyalty, about familial bonds, and also romantic bonds too. Again, these people may have done horrible things. Should you be protecting them? In my opinion, no. But you see these characters willing to do that to obstruct justice, to lie to the police in order to prevent someone from actually maybe being brought to justice. And I, I find that very interesting. While I also find that disturbing because I would hate to think that a parent, a loved one would be willing to hide the truth knowing that their son, daughter, boyfriend, fiance did something horrible and they would rather not have justice be brought against that person when obviously they should. I don't care if that person's your son, he deserves to have justice brought against him if he actually did the crime. With that said, I am not going to provide any spoilers as to how the book ends because I really did enjoy it and I think that you should go out and try to read it yourself. Obviously I recommend the audio too because that one was really entertaining and kept my interest the entire time. Now is the book perfect? No. The ending was pretty predictable. I felt confident about who the person was for most of the book. I attribute that to thriller tropes that exist and have been oversaturated in the market for quite some time. So I don't really blame the author. I just happen to know how thrillers work. Other than that, I really enjoyed it and I'm over the moon about it because I have been so long without a mystery thriller that I've really enjoyed that I'm, I'm taking it. Switching gears, I know that I have continued to read The Midnight Feast and I do have an update for you. But first and foremost, we have to address the third book that I have not named yet, and that is When She Was Me by Marley Bush. I've decided to DNF it. I know it's so sad. I wasn't even able to provide you with any type of update besides this ending result, but I really, I can't do it. I can't continue the book. I got a third of the way through and the premise was really intriguing. As I said, I loved the idea of an isolated campground. I really liked the fact that we had these sisters juggling things from their past while also trying to keep a low profile during a modern mystery. But unfortunately, in opposition to what I liked about What Have You Done, I felt as though their proportions were off for when she was me. Oh my god, these titles, I can't do it. But we persevere. So with When She Was Me, I would say it's far more thriller than mystery, which is fine if you're a big thriller reader, but I'm not. So the fact that it was more like 70% thriller, I just like was bored. I actually felt no investment in the characters. I really didn't care about what happened in their past. And it was quite bleak, which thrillers are known to be. I like dark themes, but I also need there to be some light. And these two sisters just didn't really seem that intriguing to me. They were very controlling and connected to each other, which I know is another trope, another kind of character archetype that you see in thrillers. And I had a difficult time even separating them. We had Cassie and Lenore and they just didn't seem that different. I also felt as though the narrative style was a bit contradictive because we have our main characters wanting to keep a low profile. There's a reason why they are living at this campground year round. They are the only resident who does that. So they clearly have things to hide. But then we've got Cassie, who is a very popular true crime YouTuber. What? And Lenore is some type of book writer. I just am really confused by how these two sisters want to keep a low profile while also doing things that would provide them some type of notoriety. Another common trope that you see in Thriller is the memory loss. It is a plot device that can work quite well, but I just felt as though it fell flat for me as one of the sisters struggled to remember what she did on a certain night. Obviously we're meant to wonder, huh, did she do it? But I just, 
she clearly didn't. I feel like it's such a red herring and that's the mystery reader in me being frustrated with something that's so obvious. I will say that the modern crime is quite interesting. There is another missing teen that seems to be the trend at least for two of these books on this list and when she goes missing there are certain puzzle pieces that you feel as though you need to put together the night that she went missing, the days afterwards. So if you're someone who is intrigued by that and you tend to like thrillers, I could probably recommend it to you. I just knew that it didn't make sense for me to keep going when at most I was already feeling like this was gonna be a middle of the road book for me. And now let's actually get to my update for Lucy Foley's The Midnight Feast. I'm at page 150, so I'm almost halfway there. I'm like 25 pages off from the halfway point. And I will say that my interest has lessened a little bit and I'm nervous about it. I'm pretty sure in my first update, I was over the moon. I was really excited. I read 90 pages in one day and I was having the time of my life. I felt as though this was a kindred spirit to the guest list and I was very excited. But now it seems as though with certain reveals that are very obvious to me, I'm less intrigued. I promise I don't mind a predictable narrative, hence why I am giving What Have You Done such high praise. It had a predictable ending and yet I still really liked it and I still could recommend it to you. Whereas here, some of the characters are just so on the nose for me and I don't really know what I'm supposed to take from that. There have been some developments though that I am intrigued by. So we've added another voice to the POVs, which I really like. Uh, originally there were five. We had Bella. She is someone from Francesca's past and she has shelled out a lot of money to afford to even be at the manor as a guest. Then speaking of Francesca, she and her husband Owen, they have their own POVs too. And they obviously are coming from sordid dark pasts as well. They're all connected to this location prior Prior to the manor opening from summers from living there from being locals and they all kind of resent the area in different ways except for Francesca she seems to just want to take advantage of everyone if she can make a quick buck about it then we have Eddie he is the current local perspective he is a young teen I think he's like 18 19 years old trying to figure out his life and I haven't seen him in a while actually now that I think about it I feel like we are overdue for his return, so I'm sure we're going to get an update from him soon. And who has been added to this list of characters? Well, D.I. Walker, a detective who is actually investigating the crimes that have occurred after the solstice. And we're still unsure what those crimes are. We know a body's been found. Lucy Foley is really good about preventing you from really knowing who the victim is yet. I have my suspicions, but I don't know if I'm right. Meanwhile, there's also mentions of a fire at the manor too. So are these crimes connected? We don't know. But what I like about the fact that we have D.I. Walker as a POV is because in mystery thrillers and thrillers in general, it's not very common that you get a police officer, a detective, someone who is working for the law, unless they are looking into a case for personal reasons. An example of that would be Long Bright River by Liz Moore. That one has a main character. The only POV that I recall is a police officer and she is definitely leaning more thriller in that narrative, mainly because as the police officer, she is looking into crimes that are linked to her sister, her sister's missing. So you can just see that she's got personal investment while she's also dealing with a lot of baggage. With this, D.I. Walker may be dealing with his own baggage. He does seem to be a little bit sketchy, a little bit shady. Why is he here? Apparently he used to be working cold cases. So there is some mystery surrounding him, but he's clearly removed from the events at the manor, at least for now. And I love that we have this type of detective because that's leaning into the mystery vibes. I need a detective. I really love it when we have a character like that. So I am glad that that has kind of changed things up a little bit. But why has my intrigue dipped? Well, for one, I am getting tired of the epistolary form. I'm telling you guys, it's just, it's not for me. I really don't like it. I feel like it just always rings falsehood to me when I'm reading it. Now with audio, if I did have the audio, I could usually get past it because I just kind of accept it and the voice actor is allowed to provide their acting skills to the task of making it feel a bit more natural. But when I'm reading the book and having these journal entries, I just find it grating. I really can't do it. I feel like they're usually overdone and 
it's probably linked to the fact that I'm not a huge fan of first person POVs in general. When they're well done, they are well done. They're great, but it's also so easy to do a first person POV poorly. So I, I will say that I'm not a huge fan of the fact that we've got so much first person POV in here. Um, so yeah, the past timeline just feels as though it's not providing anything too new and it does feel a bit predictable as far as the terrible things that these kids are getting up to and that our narrator, Bella, is having to experience and wondering when should she tell someone and when should she stay quiet. At the moment, I just want us to get to the midnight feast, to the night of the solstice when everything goes haywire, because it is feeling a bit stale for me. It's slowed down, and I just, I want the weekend to get to that main point, and then I can get excited again. At the moment, I'm not really sure if I will be just finishing the book and providing an end of book update, wrapping up the vlog, or if something really crazy happens and I feel like I need to let you know that my feelings have changed, I will do that. Uh, but for now, it is Sunday evening and I have some cleaning to do. I kind of like to reset on Sunday evenings. I also have an errand to run. I got to go to Target to return something and I also might pick up a couple frames because I've got some really nice art that I would like to put up on the walls. So if I do that, I will take you guys along with me. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'll talk to you guys when I talk to you and hopefully it picks up because I really wanted this one to be a win. the midnight feast and that means that it's time to wrap up this weekly vlog. I'm getting better about it like actually reading the books in a week and I'm very proud of myself. So what did I think about the final half of this book? Well I, I do admit that I think I mentioned this earlier in my mid book update that it was kind of slowing down for me. I wasn't really feeling the tension. I was waiting for us to finally get to Solstice Night when everything was exploding. And I wonder how that necessarily impacted my enjoyment of this book because realistically, the main timeline only takes place over a weekend. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we have the big blow up and we have other timelines outside of that, one from 15 years earlier, and then we have the day after the solstice as we're trying to figure out what actually happened, who died, who's the culprit, and also trying to air out some of this dirty laundry that has been kept sometimes for 15 years. So that was something that I found kind of interesting that I struggled with the mid-book pacing, when in reality, this book really only takes place over three days, but then, it really started picking up once I hit maybe 250 pages, we had 100 pages to go, and also the perspectives were flopping back and forth like so rapidly. Some of the chapters were only a page long, showing that we were getting ever closer to many reveals where people are suddenly having like shocking twists. Even with the slow pacing, I was actually really gripped by the end. Some of the reveals I enjoyed, they were satisfying. Now, is this book super unpredictable? No. I would argue that I was able to predict quite a bit of the reveals that happened. There was one, two maybe, that I was like, oh, well, 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 Lucy Foley. Okay. And I did really enjoy those. So I, I think that when I say that some of this was predictable, that's not necessarily an insult. That's not me criticizing the book. Uh, too often we see books that are deemed predictable, especially in the thriller genre, as like, oh, no point in reading it if it's predictable. And it's like, well, no, you should be able to predict it because that means it's well plotted. Sometimes there are good reveals where you're like, I didn't see that coming. And it all clicks and you're like, but it makes sense and that's fine. That's a really well written book. That's a really well plotted book by the author. But sometimes when the reveal hits and you're like, 
there's no way I would have seen that coming. There wasn't enough evidence, there wasn't enough nods, or it seems as though the author has written themselves in a corner. So to provide this crazy reveal is actually more of a cop-out. It kind of cheapens the book in itself. I would rather it be predictable than have the author risk leaning into just absurdity where I'm like, this is poorly written. <laughs> this should have been a book that the author took their time with and realized a more satisfying ending. So I don't want you to go away saying, oh, Lucy Foley's predictable, never mind. It's like, no, she, she isn't. There were some elements that I was really surprised by and really satisfied by. Like, I really like some of the reveals in this. And I was like, okay, um, were some a bit heavy handed, a bit kind of too coincidental, the way that all these characters are tied in? 100%. But you go into a thriller expecting that. You go into a thriller knowing that the author has brought all these people together, has selected their POVs purposely to ensure that they're knitting together in a certain way that wouldn't make sense in real life, but we're gonna accept it because that adds to the fun, the chaos, the drama. So to recap the elements that really didn't hit for me, the slow middle, for me, it was quite slow. I'm sure if you're listening on audio, it wouldn't feel that slow because you could just keep up the pace and keep going. But for me, I kept having to kind of like remind myself to get back to this book to actually like flip through. I was skimming a little bit in the middle. I'm not gonna lie, especially the moments with Bella in the past, her journalistic entries. I just never liked it. It always felt forced. It felt really odd. Some of the stuff she was documenting didn't feel realistic to me either that she would take the time to document them. But I digress. I'm just someone who's a hater for the diary entries. I'm not a diary entry person and that is definitely a me thing. But where does this sit in the Lucy Foley canon? So I've read three out of the four that she's published in the thriller genre of recent years. I know that she's written like historical romance or contemporary romance and I haven't touched those. But I would say that The Guest List is still my favorite, maybe because it was my first, then The Midnight Feast and then Hunting Party. It's not very hard to beat The Hunting Party because I really didn't like that book. Yeah, overall, I did really enjoy it. I will be reading Lucy Foley again. And I'm glad I was finally able to read this new release because it has been glaring at me. The cover has just been gorgeous in my opinion. I love the bright green with the lanterns, the woods. It really adds to the effect of the birds, which you do learn a lot more about. And I really enjoyed that. Did I predict what the birds were? Yes. Am I okay with it? 100%. It was the best scenario. And there we have it, three mystery thrillers that honestly, I was really glad to get off of my TBR shelves for various reasons. So with Sherry Lapina's What Have You Done? That one, I've just heard so much about that author and I thought I need to try her. I really do, especially because there's been so much a buzz about this particular title. And I would say that out of the three books I've read for this vlog, that one is my favorite. I wouldn't say it's like a five star all around best book, but I would 100% recommend it to everyone one because that one gripped me the most and I really enjoyed the various perspectives we got the questions that it made me ask about community about loyalty about if you knew that someone was guilty what would you do would you protect them or would you seek justice for the people that they wronged another book that I was glad to get off my shelves mainly because now I can stop thinking about it is when she was me by Marley Bush now this was a debut so I would be willing to keep an eye on this author see if she publishes more books that lean less thriller less tropey elements that just didn't work for me but it was a DNF and I will say that I'm glad I was able to read it so I could finally submit my neck alley arc thoughts on it and just prioritize other neck alley books that I still need to catch up on. And finally, as I've already mentioned in this update, Lucy Foley's The Midnight Feast. This one was really fun. It's a very quick read, to be honest. It took me quite some time, mainly because I was juggling other projects. I was physically reading it, but the title definitely does deserve the buzz for those who are hardcore Lucy Foley fans. If you're not someone who's really liked Lucy Foley in the past, I would not recommend it. <sighs> okay, I would say that this mystery thriller vlog was a success and I am shocked. This year, I've been really struggling specifically with thrillers. I've tried so many thrillers that I've DNF'd or just like forced through and given two or one stars. So I was really nervous, especially returning to an author that I have liked in the past, wondering if I would still like her. And then also trying two new authors that were released this year that I have seen some positive reviews about. The moral of the story is that when I'm picking up mystery thrillers, I should make sure that the ratio is higher for mystery, minimum 50-50. But if we can get like 60% mystery, 70% mystery, then we're really cooking with oil or 
boiling water. What's the phrase? I don't know. On that note, if you have any mystery thrillers that you could recommend me that do lean more mystery, I would love to see it in the comments because I do want to find my niche. I want to find mystery thrillers that I can pick up and feel confident reading, knowing I'm going to enjoy it. But if you don't have any recommendations or strong feelings, thoughts about this vlog in general, feel free to include a lantern emoji or a fire emoji because there is a lot of fire <laughs> in this book that I didn't even touch upon. You're going to have to read the book to find out. And by the book, I did mean the Midnight Feast. Thank you all for watching the vlog, enjoying it. I hope to see some of you during TBR Harvest if you're participating in that. And thank you as always to my manor guests, my sleuths, my witnesses, my suspects, and my corpses. Actually, we ended up getting an additional sleuth to the manor this past week. And thanks so much for joining. I'm so excited to have you as a part of our investigative team. We do have a few dead bodies in the outdoor freezer. Um, and they're still not sure who killed them. So if you could help us out, I'd really appreciate it. All right. Thanks everyone. I hope to see you in the next one.